Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Pivoting to Help, How, aging, how the Aging Network Shifted to Address the Emergency Needs of Older Adults. I'm Christy Sharp, Manager of the Program Development Union, Unit in the Aging and Independence Services Group at the Atlanta Regional Commission. We are coming to you live from all over the Atlanta region this afternoon as part of an ongoing series hosted by ARC. You can visit our website to find past webinars and to register for upcoming sessions. We will post a link to ARC's webinar library page in the chat box. Now I'd like to introduce you to today's moderator and one of our panelists, Alima Anderson. Alima is manager of the quality team within the Atlanta Regional Commission's Aging and Independence Services Group. As such, she monitors and evaluates home and community-based services programs provided by our partner agency. She also provides quality improvement services to ARC's own internal programs. Alima, I'll turn it over to you now. Okay. Thanks for that introduction, Christy. And again, welcome everyone. And before we begin, we'll cover a few house housekeeping items. We've taken a screenshot of an example of the attendee control panel. You should see something that looks like this on your own computer screen on the upper right-hand corner. Throughout the webinar, you will have the opportunity to submit text questions or comments by typing them into the questions pane of the control panel. You can send your questions at any time during the presentation, and we'll collect them and address them during the Q&A portion of the meeting. You will also be able to, to uh, see chat messages from us in that window as well. All attendees have joined in listen-only mode, and this means that you will be on mute during today's meeting. If you would like to speak during the Q&A period, please raise your hand or make a comment in the chat box to let us know. Of course, you may just uh, list, uh, type your questions as well. A few other quick notes. If you click away to another application on your browser, you may have trouble finding our meetings again. So look uh, for either the blue flower petal icon, which you'll see in the bottom uh, ribbon uh, bar of the computer. It'll be, it should be on the bottom side of your screen. Or look in one of the open browser tabs as well. You'll also see an orange colored arrow on the control panel for this software. And this will collapse and open the control panel as well. You can move it to another part of your screen if you desire to do that. And then lastly, today's meeting and all the webinar series will be recorded through the GoToWebinar platform. This recording will be made available to all meeting attendees via a follow-up email and will be posted on ARC's website. Okay, so I think we're ready to get started now. And uh, today we'll, we're excited to hear from a series of speakers about how their organizations have shifted to address the emergency needs of their clients. We're grateful to each of you for sharing your time and information with us today. And I'd like to share one caveat though, and that's this on behalf of today's speakers, um, all the information that will be presented today is a static snapshot of how things are right now, so how they are at this moment. So this means that the data could and most likely will change as we move forward. We'll hear from each speaker for about a total of 20 minutes and then move into a brief Q&A period afterwards. And at any point during the webinar, if you'd like to do so, please feel free to submit questions via the chat box that we showed you earlier on your right-hand side. I will be your first speaker for today, and I'll briefly share with you how ARC shifted to address the emergency needs of its clients and partners. Okay, so we're going to, we pulled up my slide here. Um, so as we, Give me just a second, I am so sorry. <laughs> okay, our first slide <clears throat> shows uh, that how we pivoted at NARC to track the unmet, unmet needs and offers uh, for assistance uh, for our clients and partners. At the beginning of the COVID-19 crisis, the management at ARC began to receive several calls and emails from local agencies. Uh, some of the calls were for resources, or uh, help with resources to help their clients with the COVID, their COVID-related needs. 
And then we also received calls from organizations who were actually interested in helping those agencies uh, with their COVID needs as well. So trying to keep up with these requests and their responses became pretty overwhelming. So the management asked the quality team to develop a way to keep track of these efforts. The team pivoted from mainly focusing on current monitoring activities to also becoming the custodians of a clearinghouse of information regarding agency needs and COVID resources. We began tracking resources, agency needs, and in some cases, connecting agencies with resources almost overnight. At first, we were able to organize a lot of information from the calls and the emails into what we call the COVID-19 logistics spreadsheet. And this enabled us to determine what matches could be made between the organizations needing assistance and then those that were offering assistance. This spreadsheet tracks unmet needs, available resources, general resources, and when possible, any resolutions or matches that were made for each agency. Next, we continue to communicate with our partners and keep track of their needs by developing and administering uh, what we call the needs assessment survey. And we did this through SurveyMonkey. After this initial assessment, we began to administer follow-up surveys to capture any changes or track their continuing needs since the time that the last survey was administered. And then finally, our COVID-19 needs assessment survey response spreadsheet um, was created as well to uh, exclusively capture the responses from the SurveyMonkey needs assessment survey. The, the feedback that we received from our service providers helps us to keep track of their needs, but it also provides data that we can share when communicating their needs to other organizations or government entities offering grants or other resources. So we're gonna stop right here real quick and we're gonna do a quick poll. And Cheryl, if you'll pull up my poll slide, please. Okay, so the question of the day is, which were initial unmet needs brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic? And I'll give you a hint, you can choose more than one answer. So we're gonna take a couple of seconds to do that. Okay, I think we may be ready to move on from there. Cheryl, are we good with that? Are we, have we had enough time? We have about 60% of folks have voted so far. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll. Okay, so I don't know, can I see here how many people said what or will we do that? Okay, so let's have a quick look see. So we have here that 38% of the people chose shelf-stable meals, non-perishable groceries, and so on. Oh, we've got a good, pretty good distribution here. Pet food and incontinence, 22. 51 said hand sanitizer, toilet paper, and the other supplies. Okay, we had about 13% that said Wi-Fi hotspots and laptops, hotel accommodations, as well as 55% that said all answer choices are correct. Okay. Uh, if you'll go to the next slide, please. All right, so the answer is everything is correct. <laughs> so uh, in this next slide, we'll see that um, the breakdown of what the requests were for our initial uh, survey here. Um, here's an example of the responses from that survey. So in addition to other questions that were asked, uh, we also asked what supplies they needed as well as what services they needed. And so the majority of the supply needs were for various types of food, uh, which we pretty much expected. And then also under the other category, there were items such as PPE, uh, the masks and gloves, sanitizers, cleaning supplies, and toilet tissue. And then additional supply needs were incontinent supplies, which was over half a, a bit over half of the responses, as well as pet food. 
And then the service needs for, for transportation and food, uh, for food and medicine delivery, as well as emergency housing and hotel accommodations. And then, uh, so under the Wi-Fi and hotspots and laptops, uh, well, actually they were chosen under the other uh, category. So as you can see that there was a wide array of services and, and, um, and just actual items needed during the initial uh, and, and ongoing uh, since COVID-19. So we're gonna move to the next slide. And with the next slide, we'll see that um, actually there were two questions that we posed in the follow-up surveys. And the reason we did that is that the initial survey did contain uh, a lot more questions. We wanted to track over time what the needs were and what the changes were. So we had two basic questions that we felt would capture this information. Uh, the first was, have any of your supplier service needs been met since our last survey? And then the second was, do you have any additional supplier service needs since our last survey? So all of this is tracking over time since the last survey, what the changes were. Um, at first, the follow-up surveys were administered bi-weekly. And then over time, we decided to uh, make those uh, surveys administered once every three weeks. Um, after we began to become more accustomed to our circumstances, that, as we like to say, the new norm, uh, and we also saw that the survey responses became more similar to the previous ones over time, we wanted to prevent survey fatigue as well. So all of those things kind of factored in, into us uh, changing that survey administration from bi-weekly uh, to weekly. So we'll go to the next slide now. Okay, so it's important to note that even though responses became similar over, to, over time, they were, there were still agencies reporting that certain needs were met or that new needs had developed as well. So tracking this ebb and flow of needs is also important when considering how to obtain and allocate resources effectively. These charts show how the, how the met and unmet needs change over time, and the data can possibly, possibly be useful when preparing for future emergencies as well. So we'll go to the next slide now. Here are general examples of how proactively tracking this information helped to secure and manage the distribution of additional funding and resources for COVID-19. As you can see here, we were able to share data on unmet needs, enabling us to demonstrate the need for grant money from a local partner that helped to provide temporary home delivered meals for waitlist clients. Another partner also provided funds for urgent and short-term client needs. We were also able to connect our partners with vetted individuals, as well as other nonprofit and for-profit profit organizations that provided masks, gloves, and sanitizer for frontline staff and clients. Tracking this information has helped us to determine where COVID-related funding can be most helpful to our partners and clients. And through these efforts, we we're able to provide a temporary solution to meet some of the immediate needs during the crisis. Okay, thank you. And that's it for me on, on the presentation. And next we'll move to our next speaker, uh, Mr. Ken Van Hoos. Ken is the division manager with the Fulton County Department of Senior Services and Fulton County serve seniors in Fulton County and help to uh, connect them to resources and services that are provided through partnerships and contracts with community-based groups in conjunction with the Older Americans Act. Ken, welcome. Thank you, Alma. It's good to be here. And thank you for inviting me to be part of this presentation. Um, of course, like many of you, when, when uh, COVID first came on the scene, we had many challenges that, uh, you know, hit us all at once. Um, I just lost my presentation. 
first of all, we wanted to, of course, continue services, uh, you know, as best we could. Uh, and we also found that there were a lot of new needs that we needed to address as well. Uh, doing both of those and uh, keeping seniors and staff safe uh, were challenges. And then one of the major challenges moving forward was keeping staff engaged uh, because we wanted to keep everybody a whole uh, as we move through all this. And with the centers closed, we have uh, a lot of staff that work in centers that, that it became challenging to keep them engaged. Uh, and again, another thing that we always pride ourselves in saying is that uh, we provide socialization opportunities for seniors and that's very important for their mental well-being. And with centers closed, it was hard uh, to provide those social opportunities for seniors. Uh, then, uh, you know, in, in our, the way we were addressing things and uh, continuing the services, uh, equipment needs popped up and also funding. Uh, Fulton County was very fortunate uh, because uh, the Board of Commissioners was very supportive uh, from the very beginning. They uh, authorized uh, additional emergency COVID funding and uh, senior services was the beneficiary of about $3 million of that. Uh, and all of this is, is to be spent on COVID related responses. Um, so change is good for the soul, right? Uh, as, we, as we move forward into the COVID world, uh, everything changed. We're not doing anything the way we did it before, uh, but there are some things uh, that were able to move on with little to no little change. Uh, information and assistance is continuing uh, from home. Uh, our information and assistance operators uh, and specialists are uh, have laptops. We, were, we found an app call, uh, called Soft Phone that is on their laptops and they're able to use their laptops from home with headsets uh, and it operates pretty much the way they are in the office. Uh, now, we've expanded our INA staff, uh, you know, using some of the center staff that were qualified and had social work backgrounds. Uh, they, they were issued laptops and, and are using the soft phone app uh, from their home as well. So we, we've been able to expand because we, you know, calls, of course, have expanded. And so we've got additional staff that are helping. Uh, with the information and assistance. Case management also is, uh, is operating from home. Assessments, reassessments, reviews are all being done over telephone, uh, but, but we're keeping up and, uh, you know, it's, it's just different doing it from home. Uh, In-home services uh, is hard to change. Uh, really, the, the, the biggest change there is just making sure that the aides that go to the house have the proper uh, PPE equipment. Uh, a lot of the seniors have opted out of services uh, for the time being uh, because they did not want people coming into their homes. Uh, some of our contractors have had challenges with keeping staff because they were apprehensive about going out to homes. Uh, but we're, for the most part, in home services is, has maintained um, with little change. Demand response transportation has kept going. Uh, our, um, in fact, this last week we expanded it. Uh, previously, it was doing only dialysis and medical trips, but now we're doing grocery trips uh, and other trips for seniors that, that uh, are willing to do that. Uh, and so the demand response has, has really not even decreased much. Um, the Uber and Lyft transportation has seen a, a decrease in ridership, um, about 35 to 40% decrease, uh, but there are seniors that are still using it. They're going to the doctor's appointments, they're going to grocery stores, uh, and we are encouraging them, of course, uh, to use uh, social, uh, social distancing, wear masks, uh, use hand sanitizer after they've been out in both, in both of our transportation uh, operations. Uh, home repair saw a brief, suspension as they uh, stopped doing projects for uh, about the first three months, but uh, they have started back up. Uh, they're doing outdoor projects only at this point, uh, but they they are back in full swing with the outdoor projects. Uh, our traditional, what I'm calling traditional home deliver meals program has shifted to, uh, 
do one day a week deliveries uh, for each client uh, rather than trying to deliver every day. Uh, this this uh, limits the exposure uh, to the clients and the, the people delivering the, the meals. Uh, we also have seen a change in the, the need. Uh, and so we are, we are providing five day packs, seven day packs and 21 day packs uh, that are delivered like I said, once a week. And so uh, this could be one meal a day for five days, uh, one meal a day for seven days, or actually three meals a day for the, for the full week. Um, services where we saw major changes uh, are uh, the center program. And of course, the centers are closed. So we've um, launched uh, some virtual programming that I want to talk about uh, in, in more detail in a minute. Uh, also, we have our partners uh, that are expanding our nutrition services. Uh, and again, I'm going to uh, put that off and highlight it in a minute. Uh, we have we actually have started discussing the idea uh, that we're calling NOSH. It's nutrition options supporting senior hunger. And uh, it's really nothing that we haven't been doing and everybody else isn't already doing, but we're organizing it a little bit more and developing a, a, a screening script that allows us to uh, assign seniors or, or uh, point seniors to certain options that seem to be most appropriate for their situation. So seniors calling in for INA may, may be referred to a nutrition education class or uh, a class on how to shop for one uh, or two. Uh, they, they may be uh, referred to a food pantry or a grocery delivery service. And, and it's a, a menu of options that, that are more progressive and more uh, provide more assistance as, as they as the need uh, increases. Um, so that's that's under development still, but uh, some things have fit into it because of COVID that, that um, you know have opened our eyes and you know again provided another opportunity for service. Uh, so we're going to continue to develop that and and work on that after uh, COVID is uh, past us. Um, uh, our congregate and adult day meal deliveries uh, are have been included in with our traditional neighborhood senior center or our traditional home deliver meal program. Uh, so we are not not all the congregate or adult day participants wanted the meals or needed the meal. Some of them had situations that, that they didn't really need the meal. So, but uh, all in all, we've we've added uh, about 650 meals to our home deliver meal program uh, to accommodate the congregate and the adult day clients. Um, we have uh, started a couple of programs to do grocery deliveries. And I'll talk about that again in, in a second. Um, and then we are, uh, we, we've partnered with some other community organizations uh, to provide meals. Uh, currently, we're providing meals to uh, a food pantry on Fulton Industrial Boulevard, the Grace Community um, the Food Pantry. And they're serving about 500 homeless uh, seniors out there. Uh, and we're we're providing the meals there through open hand. Uh, we also uh, did a similar thing for the first few weeks for, with national church residences and um, helping them uh, provide meals to their residences uh, through deliveries uh, by open hand. Um, we have launched. Uh, oh, and I was supposed to. This is this is where I was going to put my poll question about virtual programming. Sorry, I forgot that. Uh, can we do that, Cheryl? We sure can. Which question did you want to ask? Uh, uh, let's do the virtual programming one. Uh, and it, this shouldn't take long. It's simple yes or no. <laughs> so if you all are seeing the questions and answering them, and we have about 45% of people online have answered at this point. All right. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and give it maybe five more seconds and we'll close the poll. Okay. And Ken, can you see the poll? 
I cannot. Okay. Um, well, I'll give you the results then. So okay. we have 60% of those that voted said yes, they are providing online programming, and 40% okay. said no. Okay. All right. I, I was going to talk a little bit about the, and that's great because our seniors are loving the virtual program. Um, this, uh, what you're seeing now is a screenshot of uh, the first page of uh, last week's offering of live uh virtual programming that we're uh providing uh to our seniors this is actually emailed out to the seniors the participants of neighborhood centers multipurpose and adult day that have email addresses uh they can also access it online and um you can see that it has the day of the week the class is offered the time the this is chair aerobics a brief description of the class uh, who's teaching it, and then a link, a Zoom link to get on to the class. Uh, so our seniors are actually, uh, these are live classes that they're uh, participating with together. Uh, that helps with the socialization piece because at the end of each class, we offer a time for them to talk to each other. They can see each other and, and uh, have some brief discussions, and it's been really great to get them, to keep them linked to each other. Uh, what you're seeing now is uh, is our web page uh, where we've got a brief description about the virtual classes uh, and right down here there's a link to our YouTube channel. Uh, we've created this YouTube channel and uh, we're recording several of our classes and uploading them to YouTube uh, so people can uh, view them at any time. Uh, and if they scroll down the web page they can get to the weekly schedule. So this accommodates seniors that are that don't have the email uh, or that aren't already participants. They can go to the county's website uh, and they can get get the weekly schedule of live classes here. <laughs> and if you open this, um, it would show the same table that that we saw before, where it shows the the day, the time, uh, the class uh, uh, gives a password if there is one. Uh, in a link uh, to get into the live Zoom class. Then if you scroll down the website a little further, you can see the, the YouTube playlists. And so the classes we've recorded, we put into different categories. Uh, you see there are classes and workshops, computer, mobile devices, fitness, uh, life enrichment, uh, nutrition classes, and then a wellness moment. Uh, that uh, are all recorded and they can view them at any time. Uh, this is a screenshot of the of the YouTube web page. Uh, and again, you can see home has the most recent downloads. Uh, and then we have uh, under videos, uh, there, we have about 200 videos already uploaded and recorded that are available to see. Um, I, I forgot to mention the weekly classes uh, Last week, we had 56 live classes that seniors could attend. Uh, and then they can go to the playlist and see the, the videos uh, by category here. So then moving on to our, the partners uh, expanding our nutrition services. Uh, of course, we've, we've continued the, the home delivered meals. We've added in the congregate and the, the adult day participants into the home delivered meal program. Uh, but we had uh, inquiries coming from uh, from the community and from multipurpose that really didn't fit into those programs. Uh, so we partnered with our uh, with Piccadilly Cafeterias, who is our manager of our uh, multipurpose food program, uh, and also our TransDev, which is our transportation provider. And we are uh, and county staff comes and and. Uh, works with this. Uh, so every morning we've, we're delivering uh, about uh, 615 to 625 meals uh, to community and multipurpose participants. Uh, and you can see here they're, they're taking the temperature. We do that every morning. We wear our masks. We're real good about that. Uh, this is actually where we pack out the meals. This is the maintenance bay at TransDev. Uh, we keep it clean. Uh, for those uh, nutrition people out there. And we also, all the food is sealed. 
uh, is not exposed to any of the elements here. You can see these are our, um, our insulated bags with ice packs. We're getting ready to pack out there in the morning. Um, the Piccadilly van backs up. Uh, uh, Fulton County staff is here unloading the van. Uh, we've got a group over here that is counting out the, the, um, the water and the juices. They come in bags and milk crates and we count them out for each route. Uh, on this side, we've got a crew that is counting out uh, the meals uh, for each route. And uh, they, on each side, they load those into insulated bags with ice packs. Uh, then, uh, you know, the, these are the bags here, uh, sorted out by routes, getting ready to load them onto the buses. And then our crew here is, is taking them out and putting them on the buses. Um, so that's going on every morning. Uh, and these are, again, county staff that, that worked at the centers that, uh, you know, we're trying to keep them engaged. So they're coming every morning and, and helping with this meal pack out. Uh, we've also partnered with Gooder uh who is delivering uh, uh last week they delivered 1005 grocery bags and uh when i say grocery bag that's a week's worth of grocery for a, for a couple of two uh so there uh we've worked up to 1005 we've been doing 950 to 1000 for the past eight weeks um that that uh the county is is uh partnering with them and they're doing the delivery service uh, we're providing the names, of course. Uh, and then uh, this past week, we've started with Open Hand in a grocery delivery program. Uh, this is something that Open Hand hasn't done before. And uh, Matt may talk about this, but uh, we're just getting started. We're starting small uh, and hoping to build up uh, to around 200, uh, 250 people a week as well with, with Open Hand and the grocery deliveries. Uh, so through all this, uh, you know, there are some things that we've started doing that we think are keepers and we'll, we'll continue to do them uh, as best we can uh, when, when all this is over and we get back uh, to something real. Uh, the, the virtual programming, like I said, the seniors have loved it. It's taken off. Uh, we're, we're planning on using, continuing the YouTube uh, channel so seniors can watch things at, at their pleasure. Um, and on their schedule and the, the live virtual programming, uh, we're intending on using that because every quarter we, we do registration and we have classes that are, that are filled up and uh, to capacity and, and waiting lists of people to get into them. So this will be a way where seniors can actually tune in uh, and, and view it virtually uh, if they don't get in the class. The grocery delivery is great. Uh, for not much more than it costs to provide uh, five meals a day, we can provide groceries for uh, a full week for seniors that are capable of preparing their meals. Uh, so this is definitely something we want to do. We don't know if we're going to use it as an emergency thing uh, or as an ongoing uh, service, but, but definitely it's something that we want to continue to do. <clears throat> then, uh, as I mentioned, the nutrition option supporting senior hunger is under development, and we want to continue to develop that and incorporate the grocery delivery as well as, as some other things in that. And then, of course, some some level of telecommuting. Uh, it, it has been beneficial. We had we were we were doing some telecommuting prior to this. Um, but I think that, you know, this has shown that telecommuting is a real thing that can be done on a, on a wide scale and be done efficiently. So, uh, again, that's something we want to keep. And um, if you want to take a shot of that there, if you have any questions that don't get answered today, uh, you can email Ladisa Anulagu, who's our director. Uh, that's her email address and my email address. Uh, and we will be glad to um, offer any answer any questions. Thank you. Okay. We're off to the next speaker, I think, right? We are. And if our next speaker could go ahead.
Ken, I think you are self muted. Okay, now this is Ken uh, with Center for Pan Asian Community Services. Uh, so I think I am up. You now, are. Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you. Why don't we start with a poll to get everybody into the mindset of what to look for, what to identify as the needed area for seniors. So, Hill, if you could, let's go ahead and have the poll up and give the audience a chance to select what they think is the most needed area for our seniors during this pandemic. Can you repeat the question? Yes, uh, can we go ahead and have the poll up so that uh, we can find out from the audience what they think is the most important area needed for pandemic? There you go. So under current pandemic, which factor has contributed the most to physical and or mental health risk among seniors. Obviously, there's no one right uh, answer. So take your time, choose one that you feel, based on your experience and so forth, impacts our seniors the most. Okay, Ken, I'm going to give it maybe five more seconds. Sounds good. Okay. Exactly. So social isolation. Yes. Uh, you know, some could call this a forgotten generation. The current seniors, it seems like they are forgotten. Uh, even the senior centers that they visit, we cannot go there any longer. And uh, I don't know if you remember during the, the lockdown or shelter in place, we didn't know when we would have our seniors out and about again. So the situation is not good. So, so let me go ahead and go through my presentation. It kind of covers one main area, food or food insecurity. Um, there are many different areas, but let's see if we can have a presentation photo up. Cheryl? Um. Trying that right now. <laughs> okay, awesome. So uh, while the, the presentation photo is coming up, uh, again, I am from Center for Pain Community Services. And as you may already be uh, aware, we serve those who don't speak the language, uh, limited English proficient uh, population. And uh, there's the a single presentation. There it is. Okay. So on the right, we can cover the impact and risk of pandemic for seniors uh, that we all know and already feel. There's the physical, social, food, nutritional security, financial and legal impacts, the physical, mental, all those different things. On the left, you see Mr. Byung Nam Lee. Mr. Byung Nam, there's no relationship with Kang Nam style, although he's from Korea. Mr. Lee has been a very active participant of our program. He sings, plays saxophone, and even plays accordion, as you can see on the photo. Instead of going through the impact and risk of pandemic and put you to sleep in two minutes, let me tell you about how the food you see over there in, on the photo ended up at Mr. Lee's doorstep. As you all know, there are three types of meals available at county senior centers. Congregated meal on site with recreational activities, home delivered meals for low income and or homebound seniors. The third one, shelf stable meals for emergencies like hurricane, earthquake and so forth, where seniors cannot come to the senior center. First two meal programs, congregate and home delivered meals, must meet current dietary guidelines for Americans under the Older Americans Act of 1965. The guideline is not easy to apply 
to diverse cultural meals consumed by those ethnic minority seniors that we serve, such as Chinese, Korean, Burmese, Vietnamese, and Bhutanese seniors. Of course, ARC came to our rescue in 2016 and helped us obtain a waiver from DHS so, so that we can serve culturally accurate congregated meals to ethnic seniors. Mind you, we never even thought of or attempted providing the home delivered meal program due to having no experience, no funding, and no was no go for to there's Hi, Ken. We're having some difficulty with the audio, Ken. If uh, you would stop sharing maybe your um, your webcam, perhaps we'll have a stronger yeah. signal. Okay. We may have lost Ken. Now. Ken, it, it, it's a pretty weak signal with you. If you could go ahead and stop sharing your webcam. Now, uh, I think I'm back. Do you hear me now? You are, that sounds great. Okay, so, so let me go ahead and cover from when the pandemic started. Now, fast forward to this year when pandemic began to close in around us. In early March, ARC began laying out guidelines and county senior centers began to implement the guidelines such as closing down senior centers and all recreation activities, uh, switching to meal pickup instead of congregate meal, and it's expanding home delivered meal program to seniors who are not typically low income and or homebound. As you can imagine, towards the end of March, the home delivery meal program was the only feasible option left for both seniors and senior centers. But what about CPACs? What about us? We only had the congregate meal program on site that we had to shut down. We had never even tried the home delivered meal program and we had no temperature controlled meal truck, even worse. As far as we could tell, there were no shelf-stable meal program suitable for immigrant and refugee seniors. Only option we thought was hibernation until the end of pandemic. The solution to the problem came during step lunch hours when most step bring their lunch and eat together. We took a cue from instant Asian meals brought in by some staff and began to extens began extensive research on the fast growing Asian home meal replacement market. Our research focused on the room temperature ready meals that are culturally accurate, tasty, easy to prepare, and storable for long duration. The home meal replacement products are convenient meals with minimal preparation or cooking. Not to be confused with the meal in a pill like the one from 60s cartoon George Jetson. There are three types of meal replacement products, fresh, perishable, room temperature stable, and frozen meals. And these are further divided into four categories, ready to cook, ready to prepare, ready to heat, ready to eat. As a result, we were able to put together workable Asian menu cycle entirely based on variety of home meal replacement products. 
Typical home cooked meals in East Asia consist of rice, sesame, base, starch, multiple side dishes, and soup. Of course, ARC was delighted with our proposal and approved our new shelf stable meal program. Given this has been a temporary measure, as it should be, and ARC has encouraged us to find ways to do home delivered meals and provided us with funding for home delivered meal program. Good news is that we have our first temperature control food truck delivered to us just last week. It took four months instead of four weeks due to the supply chain issues. We will be riding through this pandemic on our temperature control food truck at this rate. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Alama. If you would go ahead and introduce our next speaker. Okay. And here I am. So thank you very much, um, you all. We know that technical difficulties don't always wait for the perfect time to happen. Um, but I just wanted to uh, thank Ken. This That was Ken Kim. Uh, Ken is the Chief Compliance Officer with the Center for Pan-Asian Community Services, or CPACS. And he's it's a nonprofit serving underserved individuals from li limited English proficient communities. Uh, CPACS also provides social, community, and health services to over 3,000 individuals each month. Its community health center also sees over 6,000 patients a year. So thank you so much, Ken, uh, the other Ken, or Ken K as we've called him now, uh, for sharing that information. And I'd like to go ahead and introduce our next speaker, who is Matt Piper. Matt is the executive director of Open Hand Atlanta, which is a community-driven nonprofit that provides nutritious and medically appropriate meals, nutrition education, and counseling to those challenged by chronic disease or disability. Thank you, Matt, for joining us. Thank you, Elema. Pleasure to be here. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you fine. Okay, great. Um, Cheryl, I wonder if we could pull up the second poll question that I had sent around uh, underlying conditions. We might start with that. Yes, sir, we're doing it now. Great. All right, can everyone see that poll then? Yes, we have 60%, I'm sorry. 10% have voted at this point. Let's give it a few more seconds. Okay. And Matt, people are having to think about this one. You're still voting. <laughs> All right, and I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll. Great. So yeah, it, um, when you look at the results, it's not surprising that um, many of you out there uh, have clients who who are at great risk because they uh, for COVID infection because of the underlying conditions. And when this pandemic began, that was a, a huge fear of mine. How were we going to stay operational, knowing that so many of our clients were need were going to need to be sequestered? And we're going to need to stay in their homes because they are indeed the ones who are most at risk for, you know, for COVID infection. And at Open Hand, we typically do in normal times about 5,000 meals a day. We cook, package them up, and deliver. Um, we we typically feature a chilled product um, with no preservatives, uh, very few canned goods. We our specialty in our niche is really healthy, healthy food. And so we just didn't have the luxury of saying, well, we're gonna close our doors temporarily and we'll shut down and we'll come back after the, the pandemic, is, pandemic is over because we knew we had to step up. We knew our clients were gonna need us more than ever. Um, we're so proud to partner with the Atlanta Regional Commission, Fulton County, but we're also partners with many other counties around Metro Atlanta who were depending on us to stay operational. So we had to, think quickly 
about how are we going to modify our business operations to make sure that um, we could stay operational. And so we made a lot of um, big changes and we did it at rapid speed because I was so worried about the risk of infection for my staff, for our, for our volunteers, and for our clients. And so it was a constant balance. How do, you, how do we live up to our commitment to the community, but also stay operational? And so here's what we did. The key things that we did was we reduced the days of operations for our essential food service staff. We sent all of our administrative staff home, like, like many companies and, and not-for-profit organizations. But our food service heroes, they continued to come in. Um, but we reduced the days of operation. And the way that we did that was by streamlining and simplifying our menu. We started referring to our menu offerings during the pandemic um, just as our emergency meal. So it was a much more uh, slimmed down menu. Typically, we feature a lot of choice, and it's something that we're really proud of. But in the earliest days of the pandemic, we decided that it was better to streamline, consolidate our menus, and that would allow us to get down to a four-day operation versus a seven-day operation. Therefore, less risk for our staff and less risk for our volunteers. We, um, we also really enjoy and, and value the number of volunteers who come to Open Hands Campus in Midtown Atlanta to help us package up meals and deliver them. But during the pandemic, we asked our volunteers not to come in our building. And we um, decided that only staff would be packing meals. And again, this was to help reduce risk of infection for volunteers, but also for our staff. Volunteers do continue to deliver meals, um, and they've been terrific. We just now bring the meals out to their car. We ask them not to leave the car. We provide them with the app that shows them exactly which meal to deliver to which client. And we uh, put the, the meals in their trunk, and we send them on their way. Um, I was worried about whether volunteers would continue to want to volunteer during the pandemic, and I'm, I'm really proud and appreciative that we've seen actually an uptick in, in volunteers who want to help, who wanted to be part of the, you know, the, the noble and, and humble response that our community has, has been known for. Um, we also, and this was probably the toughest thing that we did, but uh, I think it was one of the smartest decisions we made. We, we actually broke our operations team into um, two operations teams, and we had them work on alternate days so that if we were to have someone who became infected or if we had a widespread infection on campus, that it, and that, that particular oper operating team needed to be sequestered in their homes, then at least we didn't go out of business, that we would have another operating team that never came into contact with the first operating team. And thus far, that, that has really served us well. Fortunately, we, um, with all of the implementation that we did to reduce the risk of infection, um, we, we have uh, weathered the pandemic without anybody actually uh, experiencing a COVID infection, none of our staff. And so we're very grateful for that. Um, the other thing that we did was we, we started seeing a huge increase in the demand for our meals and our grocery bags, as, as Kim Ben Hoos had mentioned, and our shelf-stable meals. And not just from our typical partners that you know, we're proud to work with, but from partners across the state. Many, um, many senior centers across the state, of course, had to shut down due to risk of infection for seniors. And many of those seniors did end up needing um, meal delivery options. And, there were some programs out there that were unable to meet that demand. And so Open Hand was challenged um, to step up and begin shipping meals. And so for the duration of this pandemic, we now have been shipping meals to an average of 50 counties around the state of Georgia. Many of these counties are in rural areas, southwest Georgia, northwest Georgia. Um, and we've been proud to, and, and it's a real pride point that we were able to step up and begin uh, serving them. In normal days, we typically serve about 18 counties. So this was quite, a, quite an increase for us and, and quite a big challenge. The, um, 
what allowed us to do shipping is that, and what has also allowed us to get down to reduced operations is that we pivoted from a chilled product line to a frozen product line. And that also allowed us to reduce deliveries to one day a week versus two, two days a week, or, um, two times a week. And again, all of this helped reduce the risk for infection, not only for our clients, but also for our staff and volunteers. And finally, the, um, the other thing that we've done, uh, we had been planning to do this anyways, but the pandemic sped up our timeline. But we are now beginning to do a lot of nutrition education via our new telenutrition platform that we developed. And um, much like Ken Van Huse, we're really pleased with how receptive seniors and other adults that we serve are with our nutrition consults and nutrition education classes that are done via telehealth. Um, and it actually has helped us expand the reach because we can serve people throughout the state of Georgia through our nutrition education program. Open Hand employs about 10 registered dietitians, all who are licensed in medical nutrition therapy, which is nutrition counseling prescribed by a doctor, um, as well as many other nutrition interventions, including cooking classes. And um, we can do all of those now virtually. And so um, even after this pandemic is over, I imagine that a lot of our programming will move to our, our tele-platform. Um, and those are the primary ways that, that we've been able to stay operational and been able to live up to our commitments to be there for seniors and many other adults that we serve who are facing chronic and critical illness. And with that, um, I think that concludes my presentation. Okay, awesome. Thanks very much, Matt. And thank you all, each of you, Ken and Ken, Ken 1 and Ken 2, or Ken V and Ken K, um, for sharing the information that you did uh, with us today. And um, we just want to say that um, we appreciate you and all that you've shared and all that you're doing to assist uh, the seniors and, and individuals with disabilities as well in our community. Um, I know that everyone has gained some insight or some new information uh, today that they can possibly take back and use in their uh, facilities or in their operations as well. Um, at this time, we'll review any questions that have come in. So I do see a few questions here. So I'm going to uh, just read those and, and we'll take those um, with as much time as we can. So the first question that I see here is, Oh, and just, just a reminder to everyone, if you have some questions, it's not too late, you can go ahead and submit those in the chat box as well, and we'll be glad to uh, take those and address as many as we can. So we have an audience, we, we have an audience question for Ken, and it says, what about adult daycare centers? Is there any support for them? Is that me, Ken, I guess? Yeah, oh, yes, I'm sorry, that Ken B, which are you? Yeah, Ken V. I'm sorry about that. Yes. Yeah, for uh, for our adult day programs, uh, we are sending out meals. We are doing some virtual program. And one thing I forgot to mention that uh, in our in-home services, uh, we are offering in-home respite to uh, participants of our adult day program uh, if if there's a need. Uh, so that's available as well. Okay. So thank you very much. And I have another question. And I'm thinking this one is for Ken Van Hoost as well. But also, uh, Ken Kim, if you um, have an answer for that as well, we, we'd also appreciate it. So um, first, I'll throw this to you, uh, Kim V. Ken V. Um, <laughs> is, there, <laughs> is there a charge for virtual programming? Uh, no, there's no charge for virtual programming. Uh, we haven't been able to figure out how to do that yet, but uh, we have had some discussion on moving forward if we would be able to, uh, you know, offer it to Fulton County residents and have some kind of fee for outside Fulton County. But we, uh, right now, we just wanted to provide the service to our to our people, so we haven't come to that yet. 
Okay. And do we have any other takers that like to answer that question as well? Okay. This is Matt, and I'll, I'll take a stab at that. Um, we have a mix. So we have contracts where we're, we're, we're committed and compensated for providing nutrition education. And then we also have a fee structure for individuals who may not be served through the contracts that we have. Um, so it's both. And, uh, and the, the fees are dependent upon what the intervention is. You know, if, a, if it's a three week cooking class, that's going to cost a little bit more than a one hour nutrition consult, right? So um, a varied fee structure. Mm -hmm. Really effective way to um, deliver nutrition education in a very cost effective way. When you think about my registered dietitians not having to be out in traffic and driving from point A to point B, it's quite a time savings there. And that's and that goes for the client as well, for sure. Okay. Awesome. So it looks like we may be running out of time here, but I do want to assure everyone that if we weren't able to get to your question today, we'll be more than happy to do our best to answer whatever questions you have if you just send us an email. Uh, after this uh, production or after this presentation, and we'll be glad to get back with you on that. So we're going to bring the webinar to a close, and I would like to thank everyone for attending today. If you have any other questions or would like to suggest additional topics, please let us know. Uh, you can do this by contacting us at ksharp at atlantaregional.org. Again, that's ksharp at atlantaregional.org. And you'll also receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours with a link to access the recording of today's webinar, just in case you want to uh, just look at that again. And on behalf of the Atlanta Region Regional Commission and our presenters, thank you so much for joining us today and have a great day.